Hello, Health 230 students. This is Brian Clark. Today we will be going over chapter number 14, Life Cycle Nutrition, Pregnancy and Lactation. In my opinion, this is one of the single most important chapters in this text. And considering the age of many of you all who are taking this class, uh, it, it may very well be, be personally relevant to you, either um, in the immediate or not too distant future. But regardless, of, uh, of your age and the um, personal relevance of this chapter. As a clinician, the information in this chapter is something that you will need to know because uh, you certainly in the clinical field will be dealing with women who are who are pregnant and or lactating and you need to be able to make appropriate recommendations. So um, so I want to to ask that you pay a special <clears throat> pardon me, pay special attention to the material in this chapter. Uh, I, I oftentimes like to uh, make an analogy about a construction site and the body. And daily, we have millions upon millions, um, and maybe even billions upon billions of cells being formed. And for those cells to be formed, appropriate building materials must be present. Uh, in our case, those are vitamins and minerals and amino acids and essential fatty acids. Uh, on a construction site, you need you need things like uh, cinder blocks and mortar and brick and lumber and screws and nails and drywall and carpet and windows and all of the multitude of building materials that are needed to build a house appropriately or build any type of building appropriately. And without those key components, I think we all can see how a a house would not be built properly if certain building if, if certain building blocks were left out uh, you know think about trying to build the the home that you're living in now or the apartment that you're living in now without any lumber uh, or maybe you had plenty of lumber but not enough nails or maybe you had uh, plenty of lumber and nails but you didn't have have any windows well, by leaving out just a single component, very quickly it makes the house or apartment that you're in non-functional. And the same is true with our bodies. They need very specific amounts of nutrients, of in particular vitamins, minerals, amino acids, fatty acids, for those cells to be built. And that is especially critical during the pregnancy and lactation phase um, because a, a fetus and an infant are, are going through massive amounts of cellular division or I guess maybe a better way to say that is a massive amount of cellular division is happening in the fetus and the infant during that time frame and um, without appropriate building blocks integral integral functions do not occur because on the cellular level those cells are not being built correctly and what that results in is tissue not being built correctly. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about these items here uh, avoiding alcohol, illicit drugs, and teratogens but we'll talk about that later in the chapter. Uh, it's important to note that a new life begins at conception. Uh, very quickly after conception we have rapid cellular division and uh, it's amazing how quickly we see growth and development of that zygote and then embryo and then ultimately fetus and they do proceed on their own schedule and it, it's it's not like a construction site where they can put everything on hold for a day if um, if the um, if the lumber truck does not show up uh, or the hardware store runs out of screws uh, the process is going to continue unfortunately if some of those key building blocks are not available uh, what happens is the uh, the pregnancy terminates uh, we're going to talk about critical periods we're going to talk a lot about folate folate is absolutely imperative to appropriate fetal development We'll talk about why here in just a minute. Uh, I do, do want to touch on uh, figure 14-1 because it is um, of significant importance. It's very important for you to understand that the placenta is such that there is not sharing of a blood supply between the fetus and the mother. And if you look at figure 
14-1. I think I can maybe point at it uh, fairly well here. Uh, you see here, this is the um, umbilical cord, and we have arteries and veins here. And at no time do these arteries and veins connect to the maternal um, blood source. So the placenta is an organ that allows for there to be transfer of oxygen and nutrients without transfer of blood from the mother to the fetus. Critical periods. This is something that you absolutely must understand. And I'm, I'm going to skip forward here just a little bit. Um, and you can see here on this timeline when these critical periods are occurring. Um, the central nervous system critical period very early on between two and about five weeks the central nervous system is being formed. Uh, the heart critical period about two and a half weeks to um, uh, that's, that's about five and a half maybe six weeks and if nutrients are not available during those critical periods then you know, any one of these um, of these systems or anatomical parts can be significantly affected. And what we see is that in normal development we have a nice linear relationship between um, between time and growth. However, sometimes there will be a uh, a decrement in nutrition or a situation where a, a mother is not getting an adequate amount of a, a nutrient and there there may be an adverse influence. After the critical period and right here this dotted line is illustrating the critical period after that critical period we can have an adverse influence and the fetus can still recover. However if that adverse event occurs or adverse influence occurs prior to the end of the critical period, impairment is going to last for a lifetime. There is no recovery from that. Uh, one of the single most uh, prominent ones that we see are neural tube defects. And neural tube defects oftentimes occur because, oops, I went the wrong way, um, neural tube defects oftentimes occur because of inadequate folate uh, consumption during that time frame between two and about five and a half to six weeks when the, when the central nervous system is forming. And folate is needed for DNA replication or DNA synthesis. And of course every time that a cell goes through mitosis, and that's just a fancy word for cell division, there has to be DNA replication. And remember DNA is your blueprint. Every cell has a full copy of your blueprint. Everything that makes you, you. And you know, the, the, the DNA sequence is, is, is very long and uh, needs a very significant amount of folate uh, as well as B12. <laughs> but we'll, we'll continue on the, the folate line right now. Uh, without that adequate amount of folate, then the DNA replication or DNA synthesis does not occur properly. And in that type of situation, um, the, neural, the central nervous system does not form properly, ultimately leading to some, some, some major effects later in the pregnancy and after birth. And oftentimes, um, the, the, you're going to end up with a, a stillbirth um, due to the fact that um, the central nervous system doesn't form properly. You can see here, at four weeks, the neural tube is still open. Uh, it, it is yet to close. Here at six weeks, it has fully closed. Sometimes the neural tube will actually stay open um, if there's not an adequate amount of folate. And as you can well imagine, that results in some, some pretty major birth defects. And um, you can go out to an internet browser such as, as Google and search for image images of things, um, uh, search for images on neural tube defects and um, you'll see some some pretty graphic uh, some pretty graphic birth defects. Uh, in, in particular sp spina bifida is the one that we see uh, commonly. Um, moving on with growth and development during pregnancy. 
um, some things or factors that will increase the occurrence of neur neural tube defects, maternal diabetes, which is very related to dietary intake as well as uh, the amount of physical activity that a mother is getting, uh, the maternal use of anti-seizure medications, and maternal obesity. Uh, we've already talked about that already, but I will mention that the uh, the RDA during pregnancy is 600 micrograms a day. Uh, luckily, folate is in many fortified grains. That's a really good argument for eating fortified breads, uh, not white bread. We, we also know that critical periods relate to chronic diseases, that um, if a, a mo mother is malnourished during those chronic I'm sorry, during, the, during those critical periods, that adverse effects can stay with the, with the fetus for a lifetime. Um, the, it increases risk for things like heart disease and stroke and high blood pressure and diabetes. Uh, let's move on to maternal weight gain because there are a lot of misconceptions about how much weight is appropriate for a woman to gain. And um, uh, it, it certainly is important for her to gain an appropriate amount of weight. However, uh, we do not want women gaining in inappropriate or inordinate amounts of weight, as is oftentimes the case. Uh, I'll mention this now uh, because it's on the slide that low birth weight low birth weight babies are ones that weigh less than five pounds eight ounces or five and one half pounds uh, women who are underweight prior to conception tend to have lower birth weight babies there's going to be higher rates of preterm um, preterm deliveries and of course preterm deaths Uh, here's what we more commonly see. You know, the, the one that I just talked about, women being overweight, uh, those are far and few between. We, we, in our society, seldom see women being underweight unless there's some type of underlying issue, uh, and oftentimes those underlying issues are, are drug use. But um, more commonly, more common in our society is a person being overweight or obese. And children that are born to overweight or obese mothers tend to be born post-term or greater than 42 weeks. They have a tendency to be, be rather heavy, oftentimes greater than 9 pounds. And um, that, that's, that's a big baby, and oftentimes giving birth to a 9-pound or larger baby uh, can be rather problematic. There's going to be higher risks for neural tube defects and heart defects and other abnormalities. Uh, I'm going to just skip down to, um, uh, actually I'm just going to make a general recommendation. Um, you can see the recommendations for women who are underweight or healthy weight or overweight or what have you. A uh, good rule of thumb is about 25 to 30 pounds that a woman should gain during pregnancy unless she's already overweight, in which case uh, the increased fat stores are not needed and um, uh, somewhere between 15 to 20 to 25 pounds would be appropriate for uh for a woman who is overweight when she gets pregnant. And although your your text uh, does say this, and actually let's see if a graph, uh, you're going to see this information in your text. And um, I, I do want to point out that um, although I almost never disagree with this text because it is a wonderful resource, that I have seen uh, material that that's contradictory to what you see there in figure 14-7. Um, certainly that three and one-half pounds during the first trimester very standard ma material, but um, I have seen uh, information that says that this graph really looks more like this, that you see more of a, a curve here as opposed to after that three and one-half weeks that it goes to a linear relationship. Uh, I'm going to stop here and uh, you can pick up with um, with lecture two of three.